Last night I was confronted with an ugly truth about myself that I'm hoping some of you can relate to. I was driving through Palm Springs on my way back up in the kind of lower desert cities and on my way back up here to Yucca, I started to notice just how much I really enjoy Palm Springs in that area at night. I just think it's beautiful and especially this time of year when it's not like 115 degrees when it's dark. Uh, I just really enjoyed it, and, and I had the windows down, and, and I could hear at the stoplights, I could hear the palm trees kind of swishing uh, around, and you could hear them. It, there was that touch of humidity in the air that just kind of gives it that beautiful smell. Uh, I saw some of the restaurants and the hotels that they had there, and as nice as they look during the day, they are absolutely beautiful at night when things are kind of lit up the way that they want them to be. But as I was looking at all of this, I became aware of this kind of ugly side of me. You see, as I looked at those beautiful buildings and the beautiful sights, I found my flesh kind of craving for them. The thoughts crept into my mind that this is what I want. I want this type of luxury. I want this type of comfort. I I just want this. And as I kind of felt those things kind of creep in, those thoughts, I also heard another influence kind of whispering to me. One that called attention to the fact that this wasn't it. This wasn't the point. It it, it was comfort, but it's not necessary. And, And what I heard this voice telling me is that what is necessary is that I give my life to God. And that that's where I'm going to find worth. That's where I'm going to find true peace is living my life for God. It's not chasing after these things that I'm witnessing all around me in this this sense that I'm getting. And as I drove through these towns, I could feel the presence of God calling out to me, no, Mark, this isn't it. This isn't the point. There's so much more. But my flesh was still there. I don't know if any of you can relate to that struggle. But my guess is my desire for things and our desire for things is not new to any of us. And it's not new to this generation. My weakness for things and luxury is not unique to me. My struggle of understanding that I haven't been put on this earth to serve myself, but to serve God is not new. I think focusing on stuff over the work of God is something that humans have struggled with since day one. Since that first time that Eve took her eyes off God and on to temptation. James in our passage today is writing to people who've gone beyond struggling with this. They've just flown right into the deep end. I don't know if you've ever known people like that, that they've gone beyond struggling with sin into just full-fledged living in it. And he's talking to people who have done this with this type of greed, with the flesh that is calling out for the stuff that's all around us. They've built up luxury on the backs of underpaid workers and laborers, and they couldn't care less. It was not affecting their conscience at all. And he only has six verses here, but he manages to say a lot. So let's go ahead and and read these six verses. There in James chapter 5, he says, Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth is rotted. The moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who wasn't opposing you. It's interesting, when I read verse 1, I'd imagine that most of these rich folks here were not, or were, were probably confused by the words. They were probably trying to correct James. No, James, you don't understand. We don't weep and wail. Look at what we get to live in. It's the poor that weep and wail. That's why we're not poor, right? That's why we have all this stuff, because we don't weep and wail. And I think so many people have been blinded by misconceptions about wealth that we can't even comprehend the fact that there is pain and misery that comes along with it. That it's not all good. And here's the truth about us humans. In our flesh, we never have enough. And that's what I think I was experiencing when I was driving through those cities last night is that my flesh is just telling me, no, you need more. 
You want more of this stuff. And it's just never enough. And if you don't believe that we can never have enough, just watch a single episode of House Hunters. I don't know if any of you ever watched that show, but it drives me insane. Alexa loves it. And it, I just can't watch it in good faith because every time I watch it, I just get so hung up on the fact that we have two wealthy people who work jobs that I don't even understand exist. Uh, I've seen people who like they're, they're trading card people and like somehow they're millionaires off of that stuff. But anyway, they, they go and they walk around these million dollar homes and they have a wish list that's like a mile long and they want every single thing on that wish list to be hit. And they walk through these absolutely gorgeous homes that I've never even set foot into a home that nice, let alone be thinking about buying it. And they nitpick every little thing that could be wrong with it. And I can't understand this. Uh, they, they walk through these homes and they think, ah, oh, granite countertops, I, more of a marble man myself. And I think I can't even afford laminate that looks like granite. They, I've seen them look at bathrooms that are just huge. And I think the house I grew up in is like the same size of that bathroom. And they're like, well, it's kind of cute. I don't know. You know, a bathtub could be bigger. And I think the room I grew up in was the size of that shower. They say things like, I love the house, but I just can't get over the carpet color, the paint color. And I think if you're able to afford a million dollar house, I think you can afford new carpet. I think that you can afford to repaint it. It's just never enough for us. I mean, it's so apparent in a lot of those shows of people looking for houses. It's just never enough. It's never going to be enough. So many of us think in our minds that if I just had a little bit more, I'd be happier. I'm guessing we've all had those thoughts before. If I just had a little bit more, if I got that little bit of a raise, if I just got that little more of this, we think we'll be happier. But the truth is, a little bit more never really comes. Even if your income increases, you still have your flesh crawling out for more. You know that verse that we quote oftentimes when we're facing difficult things? Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Have you ever read the context of that verse? It goes like this, and it's up there. The verse right before this, and, and he even continues this in verse 11, but verses 12 and 13, he says, I know what it is to be in need. This is Paul, by the way. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Here's the thing. Here's the secret to being content. It's not just wanting a little bit more. It's wanting just Christ. And that's something a lot of people just overlook. They think that I will feel content when I get that little bit, when in reality, you're never going to feel content unless you're content with what you have now. These rich people that James writes to here should have been content because they had so much and it just kept growing and they wanted more. Their gross greed was about to testify against them soon. Notice how he said that their wealth had rotted and moths ate their clothes. One writer I read this last week said that that's probably talking about how they had so much stuff, there was no possible way they could have worn all of it in enough time. They just had probably thousands of clothes and they they didn't wear all of it and so moths literally were coming in and eating up their clothes. Most likely is what he's drawing attention to. You've had all this stuff. It's already going to waste because you can't possibly use it. He's drawing attention that this stuff would just go bad. He even mentions that their gold and silver are corroded, uh, corroded, 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 or rusted. That's the combination. Corroded is roasted, rusted, and anyway, roasted, even better. One of these days, I'll say the right word, but anyway. People who read up on metals, if any of you are jewelers or whatever, probably note that uh, gold and silver don't rust in the traditional sense. Not like iron and steel. They, they, they're just precious in that way. That's why we call them precious metals uh, because they, they're surprisingly resilient to rust. But they do tarnish, especially if they're not stored properly. That's why we always have to, when you pull out the silverware, the real stuff, you have to, you know, not that I own any, but my grandma does. And I know you have to sit there and polish them so that we're not eating on like look, looks like filthy silver. And it's possible that 
when he's talking about this corrosion, this rust that's happening to their gold and silver, that what's going through James' mind here is that they have so much wealth that they can't even take advantage of the gold and silver that they have. And they have so much jewelry, it's just going to waste in their drawers. It's just tarnishing away. Especially if it's, uh, I'm sorry, I think it fits best here because just imagine, just picture that for a moment. All of this wealth these people had, clothes that were going bad because they couldn't use them, and maybe that was a bragging point for them. Like, you don't have enough clothes, but I have so much. Even moths are wanting them, right? And they think maybe, you just imagine all the gold and silver they have piled up that's just wasting away because they can't possibly get around to using it all. And meanwhile, in contrast, you have their workers just working themselves to death that maybe don't even have enough money to feed themselves or clothe their families properly. I mean, what a contrast there. Wealth that's just going to waste. And that's why James tells them that their rust, their signs of unuse, this, this overabundance is going to testify against them. It sure seems like James has a lot to say about wasted potential in this book. I mean, just think back through the book, what we've seen so far. In chapter 1, we see him say, don't be merely listeners of the Word of God. Instead, be doers. You have the potential to do something about it, so actually do it. Chapter 2, he says, faith without works is dead. You have faith, actually show it. Do something about your faith. Take that step out. Chapter 3, salt water and fresh water can't come from the same spring. You claim to be one thing, but what's actually coming out of you? What's the potential that you're fulfilling? Chapter 4, submit to God and remember Him in your plans in what you do. Don't just waste the potential of good plans. Remember to bring God into the picture. God gives us the potential to live a life for Him, and yet so many people squander the chance, including the rich people that James is writing to here. Their wealth will testify against them in the court of God. He says the corrosion of their silver and gold, their signs of unuse, will testify against them and eat their flesh like fire. What a pretty picture that is. Kurt Richardson says, the rust is transformed from a witness of guilt into an instrument of wrath. This stuff that was their bragging point, this stuff that gave them luxury, this stuff that they took pride in was going to be the instrument God would use for their punishment. It would turn around on them. From the things that they had an overabundance of, uh, of that gave them this life of luxury, would punish them for all of eternity. And then he says in verse 4, basically, look, the wages that you failed to pay your workers are crying out against you. And I kind of wondered, what are they crying out? What are they saying? And we aren't told specifically, but I think we can take a pretty good guess. This overabundance of wealth that was just wasting away in their care had a purpose. It had a use. It was supposed to be doing something. It was supposed to go to those workers, to the laborers, to pay for their needs. The gold and silver was supposed to be buying homes and food and clothing and medical expenses. It was supposed to be given from those families to the church in an act of worship to God that we call tithing and offering. It was supposed to do something. And it cries out to the rich just saying, let me go. Let me do something. Let me go and do what I was intended, what I was created for. And while the cries of the wealth fell on deaf ears in the homes of those greedy rich people, someone heard the cries as they grew and carried over to who those wages belonged to. He says that the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. And actually, the title given to God there is better translated, and and maybe a lot of your translations will say Lord of Hosts, uh, or uh, also as accurate, Lord of Armies. I mean, that's the picture He's given to God. Look who now knows what you've done. A lot of these guys probably had no conscience about this at all, this contrast between their wealth and the, the little bit that their workers got. But James tells them, someone knows. They've heard the cries of your workers, of your harvesters. And he tells them exactly who knows. It's the Lord of armies, or the Lord of heavenly armies, as the NLT translates it. 
Even though it would have been hard for these rich people to believe, God is in fact greater than them. Infinitely greater. Infinitely more powerful than any of them. And He knows how they've mistreated His children. He knows what they've taken from them. And so James just lays it out for them. This life has been easy for you. You've lived in luxury and in, in self-indulgence. You've fattened yourself for the upcoming slaughter. What a sad and unfortunate picture of these people. But I, thought, I think it also is a sad and unfortunate picture of so many people in our country. And I'm, I, I'm sure... And I know it's not just the 1% that you hear about on the news that have this mindset. I don't think most of us know how good we have it. I know I don't. I've never personally seen extreme poverty with my own eyes, but I've talked to people who have. And it's amazing talking with people who have seen extreme poverty, not just poorness, but extreme poverty. People who are just living out of huts, made out of garbage, stuff that we throw away. Stuff that other people in their country have thrown away. That's what they live out of. And it's amazing talking with people who have witnessed that. It's almost like you see a hole in their eyes. Like you can almost see the sadness of what they've witnessed. I don't know how many of you know this, but did you know that between 70 and 80% of all people on earth live on less than $10 a day? That works out to about $300 a month. I remember in college thinking I felt pretty poor because I lived off of around $500 a month excluding my rent of about $150 a month. And I thought that was pretty poor. But there's no exceptions made for housing in this $300 a month. That's literally all they have. And I think it's something like 50% of all those people live off of $2.50 a day. That work out to be like what? $80 a month, 100 yeah, somewhere around there. I'm not a mathematician, but $300 a month, housing and all, food, clothing. I remember how stressed I would be trying to afford gas for my car that I owned that was insured. That it, it might blow our minds to know that in comparison with most people in our world, we have it pretty good. We are, in contrast to them, rich. By what we have. You may not have the fanciest phone or the fanciest car. You may be dealing with a car that, just like I used to deal with, would go about uh, every two months before it would break down again. You have to fix it. I know that struggle, but just be thankful that you have a bed that you can crawl into and not worry about who's going to try to steal it from you. Be thankful that I think for most of us, we have something to eat at least once a day where there's people around this world that can't even imagine what it would be like to have a meal every day. Here in the U.S., we argue and quibble over so much while we own so much. And we never think to ask, how can I give of myself to others? We're fattening ourselves for slaughter while remaining convinced that we are the poor ones. We live in comfort while others just try to survive. And I know many of you give to worthy causes and I know that you support the work of God here at this church and I, and I think that's awesome. But this passage made me reflect on my own life and I have to ask myself, am I more like these greedy rich people than I care to admit? It is so easy to judge them from a distance, but have you reflected on your own life and asked that question? And it's an uncomfortable one, I know. I may not be underpaying people to do work for me, but am I squandering all that God has entrusted me with? That's a question I think we have to ask ourselves this morning. You see, the rich people, they, there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. It's just a matter of what you do with it. And these rich people were squandering all the responsibilities and all the gifts that God had given them. They just stored it up for themselves. And I fear that too many of us in this country have done the same thing. We work hard for our own pocketbook while God calls on us to use what He's given us to bless His church, to bless people in this world, to show love in a way that maybe only you can in that situation. We'll go into that more, I think, 
in the next sermon series, but I fear that the American church needs to take a long, hard look at ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, am I wasting what God has given me? Am I just storing it up? When we went over this passage in youth group this last Wednesday, I asked them just a simple question. What do you think the rich people should have done? What should they have done instead of what they were doing? And it kind of came back to two passages that most of you are going to be familiar with. The golden rule and the most important commandment. And Jesus gave us two. Right? The golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then the most important commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. You look at these rich people and they were not doing any of that. In essence, we should unconditionally love those around us. That's the first half of our mission here at First Christian Church is unconditional love. It means that we love God without com- conditions and we also love people without conditions, even if you don't like them. That's a tough one for us, isn't it? A lot of us want to pretend like they're just, we just love, you know, we like everyone. We've never had problems with anyone. That's, yeah. I've never met anyone where that's exactly true. We all know there are some people in our life that we have to extend a little more grace to. And it's okay. But we still should do it. Right? Too many people in this country, I feel, take the easy way out. They don't like someone, they just cut them out. That's what we tell people. Just cut them out. We are to love unconditionally. We love even if it means that we get a little less in our lives while you get a little more in your life. These rich oppressors weren't doing that. They were treating their workers like garbage cans rather than people. They cared more about their stuff than they did people. If they were truly Jesus-believing Christ followers, they would have understood this. They would have treated workers the way they would want to be treated. They would have probably given their workers bonuses. They would have given them way higher wages because my guess is that's what they would want if they were in those positions. Instead, As James tells them, they have condemned and murdered the innocent ones who weren't even opposing them. They were working their workers to death. And they were murdering them by proxy. It didn't matter to them. And it's not like these workers wanted revenge for how the rich treated them, and yet the rich people still took everything from them. There are so many passages and parables that Jesus taught and and Scripture tells us that reinforce all that James is telling us here, but I'm reminded of Jesus' letter to the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3. That's the church that Jesus says, because you're neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's more appropriately how it's phrased there. It's more of a violent thing. right? This is disgusting to me is what Jesus is saying. And it's because they weren't doing anything for him. If you read Laodicea, they were more obsessed with their wealth. They thought they were doing pretty good because maybe their tithing and income was really good. They, they thought that they were rich, but he says, you're actually poor. And you don't even realize it. You need to come to me and get gold refined by my fire. Here's the thing. They weren't serving God in any real way. They weren't doing anything with what God had given them. And I worry that so many of us are in that same boat without even realizing it. And Laodicea didn't realize it. And that was a first century church. They were doing pretty good. Right? In comparison to where I think a lot of us are. And He warns them. Jesus does. I'm going to violently spit you out of my mouth. Because Jesus didn't want them to make that mistake. He didn't want to spit them out. And so he tells them how it is. Come to me. Right here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone invites me in, I'll come in and eat with them and he with me. You know that? That's right after his letter to the church in Laodicea. I'm here. I'm ready. Just open the door. He didn't want them to go down that route. And something tells me God doesn't want us to make that same mistake. And that's why these things are in Scripture. That's why these warnings are here. So have you checked yourself lately? Have you reflected on your own life about what motivates you? Is it stuff or is it serving God? Is it serving your wallet or is it serving the kingdom that we are a part of? Do you care more about things than you care about people? Here's an effective way to answer that question for you because right here my guess is most of us would say, yes, of course I care more about people. Next time someone breaks something of yours accidentally, no matter how precious it is, 
Think about how you react. That's a hard thing for us to deal with. Do you care more about things or do you care more about people? My prayer is that we as a church, we live differently than those in this world. That when something bad happens to us like that, we react differently than people in this world. When our service at restaurants isn't good, we should react differently than people in this world because we care more about the person than our food. I pray that our love for people far outshines our love for things. And I'm preaching this just as much to myself as any of you this morning. Because I know we can all do better. But on top of that, what have we been doing with what God has given you? What have you been doing with the stuff that you have? Even if you haven't been given hardly anything, what are you doing with it? What have you been given a lot? What have you been doing with it? Who have you been serving with this stuff? It's not about how much God has given you. It's about what you do with what He has given you. These rich people were given so much, so much more than any of us probably will ever be given, and they just wasted all of it. Are you going to make the same mistake? Or are you going to serve Him? Find a way to serve and glorify Him with what He's given you. And as we leave today, I just want us to imagine what this church would look like if we lived like that. What if our testimony to Yucca Valley is that we care more about you than we do stuff, than your money, than the things that we own? I care more about you. If you're here this morning and you've been burned by the church before because you see people care more about stuff than people, just know that we are wildly imperfect. None of us here, as far as I know, claim to be perfect. I certainly don't. But we know someone who is. And that's the hope that we have when we come here on Sunday mornings and as we go about our daily lives is that we know someone who's perfect and who paid for my imperfection on the cross so that I could be with Him for eternity. And if you've never made that decision this morning, I, I, I ask or I'm inviting you to come forward and talk about it. I'd be glad to answer questions you have. I'd be glad to pray with you, but make that decision. Don't keep putting it off. You never know what tomorrow's going to bring. You don't know what today is going to bring. Make that decision to give your life to Him. We're going to stand and sing the last few songs here. But I want us to wonder what would happen if we did live like this. If we lived in contrast to these rich people, what if we were known as a church that cared far more about people than stuff? I think God could work powerfully in us. Let us praise Him now.